Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday morning Life Life Bible study on Ezekiel. And uh, it's great to have everybody here. And those of you that are uh, here in the, in the fellowship hall, and Norma and Dallas and Jill and Reverend Art at home, and then any of you that might be watching this later on on YouTube. Uh, we're so glad that you're joining us. The Holy Spirit unites us together as one. And uh, because this is not just Bible study, but this is worship, uh, let's prepare for that worship. We're going to sing our opening song here in just a moment, uh, Songs of Thankfulness and Praise. So this pastor is able to get it on the screen. <coughs> Oh, there's one thing I should check here before we start. That is to make sure I'm sending the sound in the right place. I think I am. Let's see what happens. Lord be with me. for just a moment um the, anybody that has their mic on at home uh you might want to it probably would be better for us here it might be better for you so uh norma dallas uh jill uh you can mute yourself till after the song uh because we we're hearing you back um uh, about three or four seconds after what we do so okay and we have no we have no picture of the hymn of the songs we have no words oh, on our you don't no. All right, let's try that again then. Something's not right. There it goes. Okay. Is it now? okay. okay. Yes. Manifest. Still there? Yep. Yes, it is. All right, we're going to uh, actually, I'm going to do this. Let me try to go back into it and we will try to start again. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Man. 
Anything in there ring familiar? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bunch of stuff. Especially the fourth verse. Sun and moon shall darken thee. Yeah. Almost like, uh, well, I didn't plan it. <laughs> this is the way the Holy Spirit works. That we might become like thee at thy great epiphany. What does that talk about? When's the great epiphany? The end of the world. Yeah. And why is it called epiphany? What, well, is an, what is an epiphany? It's an awakening, and it's a, a, a magnificent realization of something. Especially something that's been hidden that you can't see. Right. And so what is the great magnificent epiphany in particular that'll happen on the last day? Revolution. God and man made manifest in Christ at his glorious return, his return in all his glory. That's what it's talking about. But then also it says that um, the last line is the fourth verse, thou by all will be confessed by all. Yeah. In other words, everybody that's been resurrected is going to know that this is Jesus the Christ. Yeah. Even this those that didn't Christ. believe in him and are headed to eternal damnation will have to confess who he is before they go. Because It'll be obvious. This is the one that I was supposed to believe in and did not. And because of my lack of faith, I now go to eternal damnation. Yep. Everyone's everyone. Continue on with our time of worship. And we'll read responsibly. The intro. The mighty one. God the Lord speaks and summons the earth. The rising of the sun to a setting. Hear, O oh my people, and I will speak. O oh Israel, I will testify against you. I am God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your further offerings are for me. I will not accept the bull from your house. Or, 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 or every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. Glory be to the Father, and, and to, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and forever. Amen. Mighty one, God the Lord speaks and summons the earth. From the rising, the rising of the sun to its setting. This uh, intro comes from some Old Testament verses, and I can't cite them off the top of my head, but it's, it's in Isaiah. God is saying, um, uh, in fact, Jesus is going to be quoting this coming up. Um, yeah, it's the call of Matthew. 
That's it's just coming gospel lesson. Anyhow, uh, you have the uh, the Pharisees are accusing Jesus of, of doing wrong by hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. And um, Jesus responds to them. He says, uh, I have come not to uh, call the righteous but the sick. Uh, it's the sick who need the physician, not the, not the well. He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And that, this comes from there too. When God's talking about the goats and the folds and every beast of the forest is mine. I don't want your animal sacrifices. That's not what makes me happy. What I want is your loving obedience that's supposed to be behind that. I want you to recognize me as God the Lord. Okay. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Gracious God, mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for this day. Thank you for all that have come here to study your word and to draw closer to you through it. Lord God, that's what we seek. We seek to know you better. We seek to understand this Old Testament book of Ezekiel and what you had to say to the people of Judah that were in, on exile. And Lord, you know, we are in exile too in a land that's not our own. Speak to us. Encourage us and strengthen us. Show us our sin and draw us closer to you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Hear prayer. Our prayer. Lord God, be with the family of Pastor Ken Farnsworth, who passed away yesterday. Grant them comfort and strength and hope in the resurrection, his family and also uh, his parish. Lord, in the, your mercy. Lord God, be with Norma. Grant her uh, relief from the muscle spasms in her neck and her back. Restore her completely to health. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, address the forest fires that are happening in Canada and in this country. Uh, put them out, Lord. Put an end to them. Be with the first responders, the fire departments, as they work to put them out, the forest or rangers. And Lord, help clear the smoke away from uh, all over the country where it's affecting us. Sunlight might shine, the plants might grow. And Lord, we ask that uh, in your time, you would send rain to water the crops and the grass. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, be with my brother, Reverend Art. Uh, we ask that you would grant him a happy birthday and continued health and healing uh, in all of the problems with his eyesight and with his body. Protect him, Lord, and enable him to, uh, as soon as he heals, uh, join us back here uh, on Sundays for worship. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Prayer. Lord God, be with Rick, who's having heart problems. We ask that you would address those, restore him completely to health. Lord, in your mercy. Here are here are Heavenly Father, be with Mike and with Patches. Please continue the healing in Patches' life and give Mike comfort and strength. This is his precious little dog that reminds him of his wife and what a wonderful gift uh, she is. Just uh, keep both of them in health and keep Mike uh, knowing that he is so very welcome in our presence here. We're so glad to have him. And Lord, thank you for drawing him to, bringing him to us. Lord, in your mercy. Here Lord God, be with Faith. Uh, we're thankful for the healing she's had in her eyes. Uh, be with her now as she's at her doctor's appointment. May that healing continue and may the news be good. Lord, in your mercy. Here Here Here. Heavenly Father, be with me. Continue to grant me strength of body, soul, and spirit. Grant me clarity uh, as far as uh, in my job as shepherd here and in our mission as uh, Lamb of God. Help me to be the spiritual leader for all here in what I say and what I do. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, I thank you for working in my life so wondrously and so miraculously. Thank you for having a Professor Burrison come and speak to uh, our group of pastors yesterday. Uh, help us all to take something home and use that as far as uh, how we can do ministry here at Lamb of God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, be with Karen. Uh, continue to grant her relief from pain and give her patience as she waits for her upcoming knee surgery. We ask that when it happens, it might go without complications and restore her to health. Lord, in your mercy. Your Lord, Lord. Prayer. Lord God, be with all the faithful as we continue to be sojourners here in this world that's falling, this world that's going away. Uh, as the end times get draw, uh, draw are upon us and the signs become more numerous, and as we draw closer and closer to Christ's return, keep us all in faith, always looking for Christ and putting our hope in him. 
Be with especially here, us members here at Lamb of God. Help us to remain faithful. Help us to remain missional. Always looking for how we can share the gospel message with those around us. And Lord, we ask that through our work and through, well, it's through your work, Heavenly Father, through your work, Holy Spirit, that you would draw younger people here to assist us with the job of being the church, being your light post shining out in this place. Lord, in your mercy. All of these things, Lord, we contend, we commend over into your care, trusting in your great mercy and knowing that you can do far more than we could ever ask. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to seek and save the lost. Graciously open our ears and our hearts to hear his call and to follow him by faith, that we may feast with him forever in his kingdom. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right. Ezekiel. As I said, we've got one more, one more session, and I believe when we gather together next week, we'll actually break open that book and start reading from it. Uh, but one more uh, kind of preparatory thing to do, and that is day five. When we started that last week. We didn't get very far. What we're looking at now is how uh, various prophets use symbolism and uh, to illustrate uh, God's word. And uh, Ezekiel is going to use some of that. And so we need to kind of uh, re refresher on that. So the first place we're going to turn, and we started this last week, was Zechariah 3. So let me see if I can bring that up. Okay. wasn't ready for it. Let me get it ready. All right. Are you seeing Zechariah 3 on your screen? I think you are. Yes. All righty. So we're going to start back and we're going to read what we did last week, which was uh, we began in Zechariah 3 verse 6. And we're going to read all the way through to the end of uh, chapter 3. So I volunteer to read Zechariah 3, uh, verse 6 through 10. I'll do it. Thank you. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, You will walk in my ways and keep my charge, and you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are assigned, behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. And that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. Okay. We said uh, last week, this is Zechariah. He was a prophet writing to the Jews who had returned from exile from Babylon. And they're attempting to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And uh, there's a couple different problems. One is just a weren't prepared for what they found when they returned, for the complete destruction that was there. Some of them had left before that. And um, it's kind of the same way with us. I mean, we remember the golden days. They always seemed to be better, and they had dreams. And when the reality hits, it kind of brought them down. Plus, the <clears throat> people that had moved in and, and surrounded them did not want to see this Jewish nation returning and possibly gain any kind of power. And so they were harassing. They were harassing the Israelites. 
So they're coming up under opposition. And uh, uh, Joshua, there's a book of the Bible, Joshua writes, he's the high priest. And there's also this guy, Zechariah, a prophet. And both of them are working to encourage the people to continue what the Lord has told them to do, rebuild the temple. So Joshua that's mentioned here is the high priest that came back from exile, and he's working as the function as a high priest for the exiles in Jerusalem. What uh, figures do you see here that would possibly be symbolic? The, the word branch with the capital B, where it says, I will bring my servant the branch. Yes. And do you remember what we said the branch was last week? Think back to uh, the prophecy to uh, involving David. And we talked about Jesse's branch, the branch yeah. from yeah. them from branch. So and who did that? Who is that talking about? Jesus. It's Jesus. And so he's he's the in his uh, humanity, he's the branch connected with the Messiah, the branch from Jesse's stem, the line of David. But he's also connected to somebody else. And um, do you remember Jesus' teaching of I am the vine? You are the branch. And Jesus is the vine. Who is he connected to? God, God the Father. So he is a branch connected to the Father. Jesus has not yet appeared. You notice Jesus' name isn't mentioning, but here we have prophecy looking forward to him. And when he comes, this will be part of the Old Testament witness as to who he is. So when Jesus starts talking about, I am the vine and you are the branches, you're a good Jew and you've studied Zechariah, you're going to go, hey, Tom, did you have something? It's interesting that uh, when the Bible was written and then translated, that the branch would be capitalized. There must have been something that indicated in the original languages that would have been emphasis to that. That he was a person. Uh, I don't know if there's evidence in the Hebrew that it's a capital, but certainly. Um, theologians see that as referencing Jesus. Just just from context, you can read it's a person. It's not he's not talking about some exalted branch from the big oak tree. He's talking about exactly. A person. Um, and and in a, you think of okay, so we're in this symbolic look at a branch, and as we look at the the uh, the worldly kind of example of it before we, we cross over to the spiritual, what does a branch do for a tree? Well, the branch supports the leaves, and the leaves bring in the nutrients from the sun and, and, the, and, and the osmosis to uh, make the tree grow. Right. And, and if it holds them up. And if it's a fruit tree, there, the branch is. Yeah. And how does that reflect what Jesus' relationship with the Father? Jesus bears fruit. How is that related to the Father? Does the will of the Father, right? It's the Father's will that he go and bear fruit, fruit the fruit being believers, yes. people welcomed into the kingdom. And then as you talked about with any tree or any branch, the tree, the trunk, and the branch are what you can see. What can't you see? The root, the root system, which is usually far more extensive than what you can see up above, because that's what holds it. And how is Jesus the visible part of this invisible whole? Well, our roots are in the faith and the gospel. From those roots, from our faith, comes our, 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 our works and our righteousness and our praise to God. It all comes out of our faith, which is rooted in the gospel. 
Jesus is the God we can see, but the triune God is infinitely more than we can see or understand. He's like the root system. Jesus is a part about God that we can see and know. As Luther said, there's so much more about God we can't know. That's the invisible God. And he said, don't try to peek behind the curtain. Because when you do that, you start to make assumptions about God that haven't been stated in the Bible, and they're usually wrong. We try to make God in our own image when we try to peek behind the curtain and know and describe the God that has not been described. Good. And then so we've got the branch and there's this other thing, the stone. Remember what we said the stone was? Keep your finger here and turn to Matthew chapter 16. Jesus with his disciples, they're having a little discussion, and he says to the disciples, who do the people say that I am? Well, you're Moses, you're Elijah, you're the prophet, da 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 And then in verse 15, he turns to them and says what? Read 15 through 18. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that if you are Peter on this, this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. <clears throat> You are Peter, pebble, and on this rock, boulder. And what, what did we say the boulder was? The boulder's not Peter. It's what Peter confessed. What did Peter confess in verse 16? You are the Christ. Jesus Christ. You are the Christ, which is the Messiah, the one from David. But you're not just that. You are the son of the living God. You're divine. And how does that relate to the rock that the church is built on? Christ is the rock built on the rock the church does stand. That's the confession, right? Yeah. Our confession is the church of Jesus is the divine Messiah, promised of old, uh, fulfilling all the Old Testament prophecies, but not just that. He's not just man. He is God in human flesh. God and man made manifest. Sacrifice. And then there's also, I didn't, we didn't look this up, but there's the Old Testament prophecy uh, about the cornerstone. Yeah. And on the cornerstone, Jesus said the church will be built. Mm -hmm. And who is the cornerstone? Jesus. Jesus. Once again, that cornerstone, we line up with this confession, don't we? That he is the Christ, the son of the living God, which means he's our savior. He's God and man made manifest and died for us. That's what the church is built on. So with that in mind, we have this uh, back in Zechariah. Let's return back to Zechariah. Three. <clears throat> so he's mentioned the branch in verse eight. Then behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone, with seven eyes. So the stone is looking forward to Jesus, right? <laughs> In Revelation, we talked about the sevenfold spirit. Remember that? And that's the Holy Spirit. But the number seven in, in um, prophetic literature has a meaning. God created the world in seven days. It's the work of God. Throughout the complete work of God in this world and related to eyes. So, seven eyes are how God sees everything. And especially, seven is associated with the spirit, the sevenfold spirit, the stone that has seven eyes. Jesus, in his baptism at the Jordan, was anointed with who? The Holy Spirit, who sees everything throughout all creation. He is everywhere and sees everything.
Once again, both of these, you think about the stone, the cornerstone of the church, uh, Jesus endowed with the Holy Spirit. And what will he do? He will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. Now, the people at that time didn't understand what was being said, but we do. That this is talking about Jesus. The stone is Jesus with the seven eyes of the Holy Spirit. How did Jesus remove the iniquity of the land in a single day? Yeah. Because when he gave up his last breath and said, it is finished, it was. And that Easter morning, he proved it. Showed everybody. But Pastor, was there anything for that period that, I mean, we see the prophetic reason from where we're sitting, yeah. but to the person that was sitting there listening to this message, was there anything, you know, how sometimes scripture has two means, was there anything for them yeah. to take home? I, I think that in, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see, I think as we go through chapter four, we'll see, this is all directed at Joshua and Zerubbabel. Joshua the priest and Zerubbabel the governor. And so um, I would say uh, one or both of them fulfilled the idea of the branch at that time. Um, Zerubbabel would have been connected to David. <clears throat> he was of the line of David. So he wasn't a king, but he was in charge of the people as somebody from the Messianic line. He was keeping that idea uh, in, in line that there would always be somebody from David who was watching over and ruling his people. Couldn't have a king because they returned from exile. Persia was still ruling over them at that time. Edo Persia. And Joshua would be kind of, a, he would represent the stone. He is the building block of the church at that time. He's the connection. But uh, they, they, they're only partial fulfillments. The complete fulfillment we see clearly now is Christ. If we were to study Zechariah, I think it would become clear if we looked at some of the other passages, but we're kind of jumping in here. So we need to continue on in uh, chapter four. But thanks for asking questions. I, I appreciate that. Let's read verses one through 14. Zechariah four. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold and a bowl on top of it, and the seven lamps on it, the seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked to me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, O oh, my Lord. And he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to the Rubable, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before the Rubable? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone and made shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of the Rubable have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of the Rubable. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. And I said to him, What are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said to him, what are these two branches of the olive trees, which are beside the two golden pipes from which the oil was poured out? And he said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Good. 
Okay. Back in verses one and two, you have an angel that comes and talks with uh, Zechariah. Does that ring a bell for how uh, things happen in Revelation? Mm -hmm. Angels that come to John. Christ comes initially for the first vision, and then he turns the job over to angels, because that's what angels do. They're messengers. So you have an angel that's waking Zechariah up to see this. What do you see? I see a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on the top and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. Kind of a strange uh, thing for us. But do you remember uh, if you were part of our study, uh, 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 you studied Exodus, didn't you? Or did I do that with the ladies? In, in, the, in the holy place, there was the table of the bread of the presence, there was an incense altar, and there was a golden lampstand. And the golden lampstand had seven lamps on. What does what what temporal job would a lampstand do in this holy place that was covered and had curtains on the outside and the door closed? Even in daylight, it would be kind of dark in there, right? So what would the lampstand, how it would have functioned in a physical sense? To bring light. If if and you, you think the Pentecost, why did the Holy Spirit come as a flame of fire? Bring light. He brings the light of faith. And so here in the Old Testament, the golden lamp stands. We know seven repeatedly stands for the Holy Spirit, who is everywhere and sees all things. So the lamp stand with seven lamps in the holy place that represented the presence of who? I, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the Holy Spirit. So as they're building the temple, you would get this. Lampstand of gold with seven lamps on it, that's the menorah that belongs in the holy place. And it burned olive oil. And so in this vision, there are olive trees by it. One on the right and the other on the left. And so what are those olive trees doing in this vision? Why are they there in this vision? Well, they provide the source for the light, the olive oil. Yeah. Yep. And this is some this is symbolic of um, Zerubbabel and Joshua. They are the two ones that are functioning like olive trees in what they do. They are conduits for the Holy Spirit to bring the light of faith to the people as they continue to work on the temple and to keep them faithful, to keep them going. Help them understand you're doing the work of the Lord. God is protecting you. Don't worry about these other nations that are surrounding you. See that uh, kind of towards the end here? Um, Zechariah asked, what are the two branches of the olive trees beside the two golden pipes? They are the two anointed ones. The two anointed ones are Zerubbabel and Joshua. And so one of them functions as the political leader, the other functions as a religious leader. Yet how do these look forward to a greater one to come? How do both of them together functioning as a team, how do they witness to Christ? I tell my mother. Because Christ fulfilled those two offices, didn't he? He was king and also a priest. Questions or comments? Just, I mean, we could go deeper, but just to kind of get us in the mindset of how the symbolism is working. And you brought up a good point, Al. There's usually a, a partial fulfillment right away, but there's a greater, always a greater fulfillment to come. And you generally find that in Christ or in his mission and witness. So you set the stage, I think, last week when you said in this book, and you said it this morning, so the part of the people got to come back to Israel, and it was a mess. And these two guys, God chose to be responsible to, one, lead the people spiritually, because spiritually they could be very low right now, because it wasn't like it was when they left it, or their parents left it. And two, the physical job of, like you said, what's our inclination? I got to build a house for me. And didn't you say the priority was we're going to rebuild the, the temple and the visions of the stuff that goes in the temple. So it's two things they got to do. 
the spiritual leadership and the physical. We got to build this thing. Yeah. Do I have the context right? Yep. This point? Yep. They have to keep the people working and keep them in faith. Um, Zerubbabel's kind of he that talks about him having the plumb line. He's mm -hmm. making sure that everything's built correctly. Um, and uh, so is uh, Joshua making sure the temple is built as it needs to be, but also keeping the people spiritually in faith, close to God, and encouraged to continue. And yet there's another level that tells us that this is foretelling of the Christ that will come and be the, the light of the world and the fulfillment. He but will on another level. Yeah, he will he will rebuild. How will how will Jesus rebuild the temple? Destroy this temple and then three days will rise. So the temple will become him. Yeah. He will be the presence of God. And then when he ascends to the right hand of the Father and the Holy Spirit comes, the temple, the tabernacle of God, his dwelling place on earth will be with us. Church. Wow. A lot of stuff. Yep. Let's uh, turn to our study guide now. We can at least look at uh, question 17a. <laughs> Other parts of scripture use symbolic language in ways similar to what we will read in Ezekiel. For some background on this, we read Zechariah 4. How does Zechariah's vision describe the two anointed ones, Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest? Well, first of all, what was that first thing we looked at? The branch. The branch, right? Branch in the line of David. We said that that was that is Zerubbabel. He's from the line of David. He's the leader. Mm -hmm. um, and there was the rock. Yep. And who is being prophet, prophetically symbolized as the stone with seven eyes? At that time, if the branch is Zerubbabel, and we know that that foreshadows actually Jesus, who is our King of Kings, right? And who does the stone symbolize? would be symbolized Joshua. He's the one that's in charge of uh, making sure the temple is rebuilt. But that also prophetically looks forward to Christ. Yeah. At that time, uh, not a complete fulfillment, but Joshua would be the stone with seven eyes. He's anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is <clears throat> working through him to uh, encourage the people and also to turn, keep them uh, turned back faithfully to worship God. And then what are the gold, what does the golden lamp stand symbolize? The light in the dark place. Yep. Who is? The Holy Spirit. Christ, but especially the Holy Spirit, sevenfold lamp stand. And how are Joshua and Zerubbabel like supporting pipes and work with the lamp stand? They're the oil, basically kind of the oil to help the light. They're conduits for that work of the Holy Spirit through what they say and through what they do. And that always finds its fulfillment in Jesus who fulfilled both those offices and was anointed with the Holy Spirit in baptism. Questions or comments? Notice verse six. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What do you think the message was to Zerubbabel there, knowing the job that he had to do? As governor, what did I say his job was? Keep the people, Keep the people work. Make sure that the walls get built around Jerusalem and the temple gets built. But who is actually going to do it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Not by your might or the people's might. Not by your power or the people's power by my spirit. Would that be encouraging news for him? Yep. Yeah. He was looking at a very daunting task with people that were ground down and worried. It talks about at one point where because of enemies around, those that were rebuilding the wall were always working with a spear in their hand or one nearby just in case somebody attacked. So it's not like you can dedicate all of your time and talents to you know, building this wall, placing stone upon stone, you're always around. It would be comforting to know that it's not just on you. 
God's watching over you. The Holy Spirit's watching over you. God wants this done, and he will protect you and make sure that it does get done. So we really see the continuity. What did God say to Moses? I will be with you. What did he say to David? I will be with you. What is he saying to these guys? I will be with you. I will be in you. Very good. Got me. Got your back. The reason why they're there is because God was with them and moved an unbelieving king, King Cyrus, to send them home. He wasn't a believer. God worked through him anyway. I worked through them. Yeah. Tom, do you have something? I don't know a lot about Cyrus, but it seems to me like he was basically a gentle king. He was a good king. He he was prophesied by Isaiah by name. That Cyrus would be the one that sent the exiles home. Isaiah names him. Prophetic fulfillment. Let's turn now to Revelation 11. For those of you that have been with me in the Bible study, this will be familiar. For those of you that don't, we'll walk you through it as best we can. So Revelation is a highly symbolic book. It's apocalyptic literature, which is even a little bit beyond what Ezekiel is. It was written code. Uh, part of that code helps John describe a spiritual reality that we can't see and we have no basis for. We talked about how if you uh, were trying to describe the Grand Canyon to somebody that never saw it and never saw a picture of it, you would say it's this huge hole. It's big and it's so far along and it's so deep down. And eventually, even if you're a master of the English language, you're going to run out of adjectives to describe what it is because it's so big and so grand. It's beyond descriptions. You have to see it. And John is describing things that are beyond adjectives to describe. That he's stretching the human language to try to get this reality across to us. So he uses symbols. But also it was written in code in case this letter, which John wrote on Patmos and was starting to be spread throughout the Roman Empire. And the Romans, by the way, were persecuting the church terribly when Revelation was written. Uh, Christians were dying in most horrible ways. And so it was written in code because some of it was aimed directly at Rome. Rome being the evil, evil governor or the evil governance. Um, it was written in code, so if a Roman soldier stopped somebody with a scroll, they would look at it and call the guy crazy and just let him go. There was only one copy that left the Alam of Patmos, and then eventually these churches copied it. But if you lost that one copy, so it was written code that the people of that time would understand, especially those where their, their Bible was the Old Testament. A lot of Old Testament imagery, but a lot of imagery that means things to them and their culture now. And we're not in that culture anymore. We don't understand. And an example as well, if somebody from John's time, the time of the first century AD church came here and they saw a sign that had a stick with smoke coming off the end and a red circle with a line through it. What does that mean? What am I talking about? What no do you guys smoke, want? No smoking for us. They would have no idea what that meant because they're not in our culture. So there's signs and symbols used that meant something to them, the first century church. They don't mean anything to us, so we have to look back in culture to interpret it. That's apocalyptic literature, and uh, that's what we're up against here, and we'll do the best we can. Let's read Revelation 11, verses 1 through 13. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. That's a good scripture, brother, but that's not Revelation 11, verse. Uh, no. no. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I see. But I'm looking. No, go ahead, brother. You got it. Norma, do you have it at all? Yes. Okay, would you care to read Revelation uh, then I was... Sorry to call you back. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt what you were doing. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, closed in sackcloth. We'll stop there He's for just a moment. We've got, uh, John's given a measuring rod. 
And it's important to know, and, and, and the symbolism here is if you measure something, you're claiming ownership. And so this is God kind of saying, you measure this temple for me, uh, measure the temple of God and those who worship there, the inner court that's uh, surrounding where the holy place and the holy of holy was, measure that, God's laying claim to that. He's going to protect that. Uh, he said, don't measure the outer court, leave that out for it's given over to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Leave that out because I'm not going to protect the outer court of the temple. The inner court translated to the Christian church, that's word and sacrament of worship. God says that will continue on until Christ returns. It'll always be there. The outer court uh, represents the institutions, the buildings. Lamb of God Lutheran Church, this building is an outer court. Uh, the LCMS is an outer court. Human institutions that function for the church are an outer court. Those won't necessarily be protected, and those could and will eventually disappear or fall away. But Christ promises there will always be word and sacrament ministry, always word and sacrament. Trampled by the nations. The nations represent the unbelieving world. 42 months is, uh, is the same as uh, 1,260 1, days. It's uh, three and a half years. Numbers are symbolic in Revelation. Three and a half is a limited period of time. It's half a seven. Seven is God's complete work on earth. Three and a half is half of that. It's a definite period of time, not the whole time, but God decides when it starts and when it stops. So this period when um, the uh, church in various places around the world where the outer courts, the human institutions are trampled on will be a definite period of time, not the whole time, but a time when God says it starts and God says when it stops. He's in control. of it. Same thing when it talks about my two witnesses. Ah, two witnesses. Does that sound familiar from Zechariah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the two witnesses represented the two different functions. Right. The governor, who's a rubable spiritual leader in the and Joshua. Right. And so once again, word and sacrament. But also in, in Jewish, uh, in the Jewish idea, if you were to testify to something in court, two witnesses. You needed two witnesses to verify that it was truth, not just on one witness, two or more. And so when God sends his church out, even in the midst, well, the outer courts are being destroyed. The church is to continue on in its mission of preaching the gospel, and it does so by preaching word and sacrament, gospel, and law, and we do it in conjunction with each other. Somebody to back up our word. It's not just one missionary out there. There are others coming behind, set by God to back it up. Okay, Norma, you want to continue on in verse 4? I'll see if I can let you read till 13. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presence because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the tree and after to the three and a half days, a breath from the life of God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice 
from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second wall has, okay. That's, thank you very much. So once again, we have olive trees and two lampstands. Um, this talks about the, the uh, ministry of the church to proclaim the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and who's protecting them? Verse five, anyone would harm them. Fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. The Lord protects them. Spirit working, yeah. God is protecting them. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. They have the power over waters to turn them to blood to strike the earth with every kind of plague. Uh, this symbolically represents how God uses whatever means for, to protect his church, to keep the ministry going, the gospel being proclaimed where he wants it to until he decides the time is over for it. Um, he works maybe through some more normal means here in this country so far, uh, through the means which are the laws, which up until now have protected the church, maybe not for much longer. Uh, but if you talk about missionaries in the field, want we'll to talk about some miraculous events protecting you, it happens. Uh, I was heard recently, and I've heard about this a couple of times, don't remember if it was South America or Africa. I think it was South America. Um, there was a missionary who had come and had this hut, and the tribe had decided that what he was talking about stood against their gods. They worshiped gods of the trees and the forest and that kind of thing, and that they needed to die. And so these uh, this, this tribe came and were going to attack his house, and I believe... He was given a warning to flee, but he couldn't flee before they got there. And he saw them encircling the house. And all of a sudden, they just left. They turned around and left. And then later on, he was able to minister to them and witness to them. And some of the members of that tribe came to faith. And so he asked them, why did you guys turn around and leave? He said, there was this huge army. These great big guys that were encircling your house. They had huge swords. God let those natives see the angels that were protecting that mission. God wants his word to be proclaimed. He'll use whatever means to make sure it happens. And why is it that some missionaries die? Well, that's the idea here. You have these witnesses that uh, will, uh, after they finish their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit, that Satan and his means that he used will make war on them, conquer them, and kill them. In certain times uh, throughout history, in certain areas of the world, the church has disappeared. Either by persecution from government or by corruption. Um, in, in Russia, the church went underground for a while. In, in uh, Germany, during Nazi, the Nazi era, the church was there, but it wasn't proclaiming the true gospel. It was working, the, the, the public church was working with Hitler to go after the Jews. The real church went underground. So that's all of how this kind of symbolism works. But you see here in Revelation, we're calling back to uh, Zechariah where the lampstands and the witnesses using that testimony from the Old Testament <coughs> that the church of John's time would understand and get because that was their Bible. <coughs> Notice that the uh, these witnesses, it talks about them being resurrected. So in many places in the world, the church disappears, but it comes back. God resurrects it and brings back his witness. And then, of course, when individuals, their time are done on earth, or the church, when its time is done on earth, when Jesus returns, what will happen to it? It goes to be with the Lord forever. Come up here. Come with me. Well done, good and faithful servant. Questions or comments? One other place to look, one of my favorite passages of Revelation 
uh, chapter 22. Revelation 22, and we want to read verses 1 to 5. Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Though the, the middle of the street of the city, through the middle of the sea of the city, also on either side of, of the river. The tree of life, a little louder, huh? the tree of life with 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of these trees were for the healing of the nation. No longer will there be any accused, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And Right, right. In, night in that night, and night will no be no more. There will be no light to lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Keep in mind, Revelation is highly symbolic. These things it's talking about represent a spiritual reality that's hard for us to imagine. Um, but the water of life does that ring a bell? Living water, swimming at the well. Yeah, Jesus. And actually, I'm gonna. You don't need to turn here. I'll turn here. But Ezekiel, at one point, will talk about um, water. <clears throat> In fact, chapter 47, when we get there, is really neat. It's a whole chapter about the this river that flows uh, out of the temple from the altar, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It starts out as just a little stream. Until finally it's so big you can swim in it. And uh, let's see, Ezekiel 47, verse 12. And on the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. What do you think this river is? It's flowing from the temple, flowing from the altar in the temple. Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus picks up on this. And uh, one of the places is John 4. He came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, and there the field that Jacob had been given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, worried as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman from Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Get it? They were, they were at odds with each other big time. In fact, Jews wouldn't even travel through Samaria because if you weren't in, in power, if you didn't have a whole bunch of people with you, you'd get robbed. You did a sermon on that. Yeah. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it? Uh, okay. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and who is it that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living, living water. water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us a well to drink from himself as he did his sons and livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks of this water from this well that you're drinking will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So once again, the Holy Spirit, and not just the Holy Spirit here, but Jesus is talking about the faith relationship that the Holy Spirit establishes with him. Holy Spirit comes into our life with baptism one time, and it just keeps flowing. That relationship of faith just keeps flowing and flowing and flowing. So turning back to uh, Revelation 22. <clears throat> Uh, 
Here we have John talking about the river of the water of life, the Holy Spirit's faith relationship that he had created with Christ. That relationship isn't just so now. The relationship created in you in baptism keeps on going for eternity. It began now and it never ends. And in the middle of the street also, on each side of the river, the what? Trees. Tree of life. And in our question here, it talks about when God expelled Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, a flaming sword and a cherubim blocked the way of access to the tree of life. It was meant to protect them from taking its fruit and eating it to live forever in a permanent state of sin and separation. They first ate from which tree? Good and, evil. Good and evil. And once they ate from that, they were fallen. They were in a sinful state. Had they eaten from the tree of life, they would have lived forever apart from God. As it is now, we don't live forever. We die. But we die not to remain dead. We die to rise again to this new eternal life with Christ where we will be completely reborn and restored back to the, the uh, perfection that Adam and Eve had once in the garden. And so here, this is talking about eternal life. And what do we see in eternal life? We see, once again, the tree of life. And now we can eat from it. Because now we will live together, not in eternal damnation, but in eternal blessedness with Jesus. Twelve kinds of fruit, which represents the twelve apostles or the twelve church. There's fruit enough for everyone, for all God's children. Uh, the leaves of the tree are for the healing of all nations. There'll be no sickness. There'll be no pain. There'll be no suffering. No longer, verse three. No longer there'll be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. Jesus will be there, and you will see Him in all His glory. You get to talk with Him, and we'll worship Him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. His name is on your forehead now. His name was put there in your baptism. You belong to Christ. You're baptized into Christ, baptized into the triune God. Night. Night will be no more. Night for John wasn't just, is the sun out? Night had a spiritual connotation to it always. So what would that be? How would night reflect spiritual sense like an absence from god yeah evil or lack of knowledge of god there'll be none of that you will know god there'll be no evil you will know god you will see god you will see christ and you'll know it there'll be no need of lamp or sun which does not mean in eternal life there won't be a sun shining i think there probably will be but you won't need that god provides light as we looked at uh, Genesis 1 uh, this last Sunday, uh, God created light, and then a few days later, he created the sun and the moon. Sun and the moon are not, they, they, are, they shine light as God's tools, as his um, means to bring light. But light doesn't come from the sun. Light is a gift from God. And the fact that the sun can even shine light out is a gift from God who made the sun. But God is a source of light. <clears throat> um, God himself is light, right? His holiness is light. Both in a physical sense and a spiritual sense, the light of the knowledge of what is true and good and right. Verse five, the Lord God will be their light. And with him we will reign over all things. Dominion restored to us and we'll be able to perfectly take care of his creation forever. Questions or comments? Just an idea of how symbolism is used. Once we get an understanding of what's being talked about, especially in the sense of the people who were reading it at that time, but also the Old Testament sense. And some of the things from Revelation we'll grab from Ezekiel because he used that symbolism. One more thing, uh, and we'll bring this to a, bring this to a uh, close. How is the cross in its own way a tree of life? What kind of wood was used for the cross, you think? Was it still planted in the ground? Was it a tree that was planted in the ground? No. 
-hmm. was cut. So it was dead, right? Basically dead wood. Yet, what happened on this dead wood for us in a spiritual sense? Gave us life. It, it was the tree of death for our sins, right? Mm -hmm. But for us, it was the tree of life. Because with all of our sins gone, we now inherit eternal life. Christ heard that for us on the cross. Questions or comments on that? That's what I think the author is getting here is, is the cross being a tree of life. Death for sin, life for us, new life in Christ. The prey is, it is finished. Recall the Advent hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Why are we Christians described as captive Israel in need of ransom? Mourning and lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Why are we described as captive Israel? What are we captive to? Yeah. Sin. And why are we in lonely exile? In the fallen sinful world? We separated ourselves from God. We put ourselves in exile. We did it. We separated ourselves from God. Until the Son of God appears and brings us back. More symbolism that you're very familiar with, and you've sung that song before, but maybe just never really thought about what it was saying. Good. We'll end it there. Uh, when we come back, we're going to start uh, session two. And if we have some time, we'll read the Enrichment Magazine, uh, uh, pages two to four. Maybe we'll do that, and then we'll start on uh, session two to one. Any other final thoughts or questions? Anything you wanted to say or ask that you didn't have a chance to? So now we're all ready for Ezekiel. Brace yourself. <laughs> it should be good. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these this preparatory work that we've done and how it's opened our minds to how you use symbolism, how you've used it in Revelation, and you've used it in other places in the Old Testament. Uh, be with us as we study this. Help us to open our eyes to what you were telling the people then and what you're telling us, because we are like Judah, the Jews in exile. We're in exile in a fallen world, yet we hope and we trust in you, that just as you brought them back home to Jerusalem, you will bring us to our promised land, eternal life, where we will worship you in perfect holiness and happiness forever. Always let that be our hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. We'll see you all this evening.